Well, good evening, friends, pilots, historians, cousins, aunts. Um, my name is Ramona Marr, and I'm a member of the content and programming team here at the Chinatown Storytelling Center. And this is where we are endeavoring to tell and celebrate the well-known and the lesser-known stories. And I just want to thank you all for joining us to explore a few of them, because this is a real niche topic. I'd like to acknowledge that we're grateful to live and work here on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Not only are we based here, but the stories we will touch upon tonight take place all across Indigenous lands. First, we're going to transport you back in time to 1936, not too far away in Market Alley. My colleague, Susanna Ng, she's very shy, she produced this short film about two Vancouver teenagers with an oversized hobby. We'd like to show it to you first, and then you'll meet our first guest, Evelyn Wong, in the film, and then you'll hear from her. When Vancouver was still awash in anti-Chinese sentiment in the 30s, brothers Robert and Tommy Wong defied all stereotypes by fulfilling a childhood passion. Robert Chun Wong's love of flight was ignited in childhood when he built and flew model airplanes with his younger brother. But in the spring of 1935, Robert began to plan something bigger. Dad was a 17-year-old student at Vancouver Technical and Vocational School when he came across an article in his favorite magazine. It described how to build your own plane with wood glued and nailed together and covered with fabric, just like his model planes. He was confident he could build it. Robert researched everything, the availability of materials, engine and government certification. He calculated he could build a Pete and Paul model for only $500. His parents gave him their wholehearted support. A large room in the family's apartment at 124 Market Alley became Dad's workshop. His younger brother, 12-year-old Tommy, volunteered to help from day one. They set off to an auto wrecker on Granville Street to look for a used Ford Model A car engine. At a lumber yard around Main and 3rd, they found plenty of aircraft-grade BC wood. There was surprising encouragement and support from outside of Chinatown. The Boeing aircraft factory at Coal Harbor provided workspace, tools, and advice. Imagine the excitement in Chinatown when the enormous fuselage and wings were brought out of their family home in Market Alley and loaded onto a truck on Hastings Street. News of their efforts even reached the mainstream media. The Vancouver Sun put a positive spotlight on the Chinese community with an interview and photos of Dad and Uncle Tommy assembling the plane at the Boeing Aircraft Factory at Coal Harbor. Boys build own plane, talent shown by BC Chinese brothers. In July 1936, after a year of hard work, mostly during summer holidays, the plane was completed with registration CFBAA. It was a gleaming silver single-seater plane with an open cockpit, 30-foot wingspan, and no brakes. A Piat and Pull Sky Scout. Finally, on a sunny day in July 1937, Dad took off its CFBAA at Vancouver Airport on Sea Island. The plane flew beautifully. It was a proud day for his parents and family. Robert logged in 100 hours of solo time in his home-built plane and went on to earn a Bachelor of Science in Maintenance Engineering. During the Second World War, Robert and Tommy volunteered to serve in the Air Force. Dad was proud to serve as flight engineer and test pilot in the elementary flight training school for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uncle Tommy also served in the RCAF as flight instructor and warrant officer. When the war ended, Dad and Uncle Tommy didn't expect to get jobs in the aviation industry, so they started a flying school to train Chinese pilots who could look for jobs in China. But Canada was changing. The Chinese Exclusion Act was lifted. 
and Canada needed pilots. By 1950, Central Airways in Toronto was the largest flying school in Canada. By the time Robert and Tommy retired in 1982, Central Airways had trained over 8,000 pilots, including air cadets, bush pilots, and many of the first captains of TransCanada Airlines and Air Canada. As you might gather from the film, Evelyn grew up with her father's love of flying. She earned her pilot's license herself at 19, the age her dad was when he built his plane. Evelyn is currently visiting from her home in Singapore, where she is a children's book author. And just an hour ago, we discovered we're half cousins. Please welcome my half cousin, my new half cousin, Evelyn Wong. Thank you very much. It's just been amazing. Um, we arrived here at about 3.30 for a, a, a pre-tour, and we discovered over there, you'll see later, our family, our family photo is there, which you didn't realize. Yes, the, my, my, like my aunts and my uncles and my father, they're there. <laughs> and then when we went over here to Hong Kong Cafe, they had, and I was saying, oh, that's Victor and, and uh, Vernon Lum, my, my, my mum's side. And she, <laughs> this is where we discovered, I'm going to take up my 15 minutes and I have to sit down. But... <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> my uncle Victor, his uh, wife, is her mom's sister. So this is, so so we know Glenford, my <laughs> uh, Georgina is Alfred, uh, Vicky, Vicky and Alfred. So there you are. It's just been a, a wonderful visit, and I have to thank the Vancouver Storytelling Center for being here. And I'm going to start to cry, but <laughs> it's just wonderful to be able to give us this opportunity to share our stories. And the connections are just amazing. So this is the picture you saw in the film. And this model was made by a former student of my dad's. Uh, he learned to fly at Central Airways. And he was a model plane buff. And my dad and uh, you know started by building model airplanes much simpler <laughs> from Woodward's department store. <laughs> he built so many, he bought so many that the department store offered him free planes, kits, you know, $1.50 kits, if he'd build them there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, and he did. I think that was his first marketing lesson, my mom says. Um, but that, that seeded his passion for flying. And um, anyway, so this plane was built, a uh, model, and in 1986, Paul Yi um, was, uh, did a curation of an exhibition uh, in Chinatown to celebrate the gold, Golden Jubilee of Vancouver, and he asked my dad if he would share the story. So he was able to bring this plane, and um, by then, in 86, he had retired. Um, the saddest day of his life was when he had a mild heart attack in 82 and his license was revoked. Um, so he, you know, that, that was very sad for him, but it was a wonderful opportunity to share his story in 1986 in the Jubilee. Um, so uh, in his recollections, and I think while, when he was working until 82, he had no time to write. He had a diary and every day it was good weather, good flying, <laughs> bad weather, no flying, good weather. No, so that was his diary. But, but in, in 86, um, he did write, and what he wrote, uh, I'd like to just share with you, as he showed this model, um, uh, he said, I learned that one has a capacity to do an enormous amount of work. If you have the confidence in what you are doing, proceed with a positive attitude, keep at it, and you will achieve your ultimate goal. And that was him looking back at what he called his Piet and Paul period. <laughs> Um, of 1935 to 37, a time of discrimination, a time of the Great Depression. He was one of 12 children <laughs> living in Market Alley. Um, uh, you know, but he just focused on his passion and people came and helped. And it was a wonderful community. So that's me, <laughs> 1958. And I have to say, um, I didn't know the story about my dad. And he's a man of few words. Um, a wonderful father, we knew he loved flying. Um, by the time I was born in 1950, now you can figure out my age. <laughs> um, 
you know, the, we didn't know, but you know, Toronto Island Airport Centre Airways was the largest flying school in Canada. But we took the train three days. Um, hit a moose <laughs> and visited Vancouver, and he took a photo of, of me here, and then you saw the photo of him in the video in the video, right? So I had not realized the import of this. It's right behind the um, uh, Wong Clan Association, the Mongkyang School, opposite on the Market Alley. Yeah, but I don't think it's like that now. <laughs> yeah. So this is, um, the, the, you know, so the. Yeah, so the Vancouver Storytelling Center is the skinny one. I can't, I don't have a pointer. And right, sort of right beside it was the hotel that my father, my grand, paternal grandfather uh, had, had managed. It was 100 rooms. And my dad with the, like 12 siblings lived there on the second floor. But the depression came and there were mainly Chinese bachelors living there. So he had no rent. <laughs> so they had to give that up. And they moved to Market Alley, which you see is behind the Mongkyung School. Opposite, you'll see some writing there. It's not very clear. The Lum family, they lived there 1919 to 1930s. Then they moved across the street. And then the Hong Kong Cafe, which is my, my uncle's, uh, you know, started around there. But my mom was you know, across the street and would see my dad and the family. But they kind of met at the Mongkyung Chinese classes. <laughs> and the teacher pointed out my mom. <laughs> to, my, that's what my Uncle Vernon says. Yeah, Danny is. <laughs> he, yeah, <laughs> he says the teacher po pointed, pointed them out. So uh, that, that's kind of an interesting piece of sort of putting together the story right here between Columbia and, and, and uh, Maine. So this is Vancouver. Technical School, and I just wanted to mention this because we have Chris here from Vantec, <laughs> a teacher, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, this is 1937, and you see he, my dad is in the front, and then there was one Japanese uh, towards the back, and I think there were not that many Asians at Vantec at the time, um, but my dad remembers it was the principal of Vancouver Technical School. After he graduated, he encouraged him, keep studying. You know, go on as far as you can. And the uncles, the late Chinese laborers in the hotel and in Chinatown would always tell my dad to keep studying, keep studying. And he kind of thought, why? Like, you know, <laughs> because no one would hire him, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, it was because of the principal, uh, James Sinclair, that he did continue. And he went on. Um, to Parts Air College, which was the first certified air college in North America um, in East St. Louis. And that is the hometown, of course, of Charles Lindbergh. And um, this, uh, Charles, this Mr. Parts was a friend of Charles Lindbergh. This is my dad. Um, so he went on, um, and um, the two-year program included aerobatic training, and it was a nuts and bolts of maintenance engineering um, and they taught only 20 hours of flying. You expect to know how to fly before you came. Uh, when he learned to build the aircraft, he had no idea. He did not yet have a license. Um, yeah, so that's him doing the aerobatic training. Uh, and uh, he graduated in 1940, December, with a Bachelor of Science in Maintenance Engineering. So he's the only one of the 12 that continued, and it was very fortunate. And this is really a story about family support, because the siblings chipped in, they helped, because they knew that he knew what he could do, wanted to do, and he had the ability. So they all supported. And my aunts had stopped school. They were running restaurants. Many had to move east for better opportunities because of the Depression. Um, but the family money helped my father to continue school. When he was in <laughs> uh, Vancouver Tech, this is the magazine. It's in 1932. Modern Mechanics and invent Inventions. Uh, so it was very special to have been able to get this on eBay. <laughs> but you can imagine my dad, you know, flipping to this. It says, plans for the Pietenpol Sky Scout. And, and you know, uh, Bernard Pietenpol was the m fellow who invented home builds. Um, he had, it's a long story, so I can't, can't share all this with you. But he said, Anyone can do this. And you don't have to know how to fly. You just build it and go. You know, it was really, <laughs> that's it. So, so all the plans are here. My dad said, well, this is like my model airplane. You know, it's wood frame, it's glue, there's fabric. I think I can do it. And then, you know, like my, my grandparents, I mean, 
opportunity, right? You're not going to tell your children, oh, it's not safe, you know, like, <laughs> they go for it, right? There's a possibility of a future. So off he went. And they, they had nowhere to build it except in their family home in Market Alley. So that, that's, that's, uh, this magazine is so wonderful to imagine him flipping through when he was in second, just finished second year at, at Van Tech and he was 17 years old. Popular Aviation, 1937 um, magazine. And there's a, what our readers are building in the line of light airplanes, light planes. And they have the picture of my dad and Uncle Tommy. And, it's, and it talks about how they did it. Uh, and then it says, Robert S. Wong built this fine piat and pull, which many say is as fine as a factory job. <laughs> My cousin Denny is here. His mom, who was in the, the 1945 Toronto Star article, was my mom and Aunt Winnie. Aunt Winnie was 12 years old, so in between Uncle Tommy and, and my dad. She helped my grandmother and her friends. They come from Chinatown over to the Boeing factory at Coal Harbor, and they stitch the fabric onto the airplane at the Boeing factory, and they use the industrial machines. And so my 12-year-old my Aunt Winnie wanted to help. So she walked from Chinatown to Coal Harbor for a week or two to help. <laughs> so there you are. And then when she was older, she said she brought many boys <laughs> to learn to fly at the Toronto Island Airport. She should have got a commission. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So uh, just how the family is so important. While my father was serving in the uh, RCAF, he came back to Toronto, sometimes to Vancouver, Nanaimo. Tony is the son of my dad's elder brother, second eldest brother. And he was nine years old here, 1942. And he became the manager of Centre Airways. <laughs> Soon as he finished high school, he went to Toronto. Because, you know, job opportunities, right? No one hires Chinese. Um, and he stayed there right through to the 80s, so, yeah. And there's my mom and dad. So while my dad, so we're talking about wings over Canada, right? <laughs> so uh, what he, when he was in, just finishing uh, at Parts Air College, the government called and said they need pilot engineers. So he didn't go to his graduation and he joined the pilot training uh, under the British Commonwealth training plan. And he was in Windsor. But he came, went back to uh, Vancouver to marry my mom in <laughs> 1944. And there's your Yu Cho Chow, <laughs> the chop, chop on the bottom. <laughs> and then my mom went back to Windsor with my dad for him to finish his service in 1944. Then the war ended, and um, no one is going to right, employ. Uh, so there's the picture of my mom and Aunt Winnie there. And um, they're assuming that he's going to go back to China. And so just a quick one you saw, these were Chinese Canadian pilots. And within a month, uh, a fire burnt the two planes he had, Tiger Moss burnt. But it became an opportunity because he then licensed to uh, start Central Airways. And there you are into the 1980s. Um, he sold it to another fellow because of his heart, heart attack. But it, you know, it was a beautiful, he saw the city grow from 1946 to 1982, Toronto just changed. And of course, the laws changed. The, the, you know, the, ex the Discrimination Act, the Exclusion Act was repealed in 1947. I'm going on to Hamilton, Ontario, because uh, in 19 2018, they discovered this twin engine, Piper Apache, that still had the word Centre Airways. This is 2018. And they said, if this is what we think it is, it's a piece of Canadian history, and they found the registration plate is indeed the first Piper Apache brought into Canada from the US, and this aircraft was seen to transform the way pilots were trained for commercial pilot training, and so they restored it, uh, and this is it now. Um, and it's at the Eva Rothwell Center, a community center for inner city youth and families, um, it's amazing young uh, person I've only met on the email and I'm going to see him on the 9th of July. When they unveil this, they put a simulator in it. It was restored by Mohawk College students as a learning process. Um, the airline, aircraft industry uh, chipped in, they've got sponsors. And it's going to be for, they're going to start a junior cadet program on the 9th of July, uh, 15 children a year particularly women. <laughs> so they have a plaque, they asked my sister, she has a commercial pilot's license and I have a private 
pilot's license, and we just said a few <laughs> encouraging things that if we can do it, you can do it. <laughs> so they want girls particularly to think about some any anything to do with aviation. It doesn't matter what, but sit in here and dream your dreams. Doesn't have to be about aviation. Just dream, and you can. So this is a wonderful story, and behind it is a CPR train that's been refurbished, and it's a literacy express. It's a, for uh, literacy for children. So it's a wonderful community center th wh where we're going. And uh, Marcia, Marcia lives in Nanaimo, but she was the f one of the first students, woman, she was the first woman instructor that my dad hired. <laughs> and um, she, you know, if you have time later, please talk to her and her story. Um, she is currently a captain of a Boeing 777, <laughs> and she's been 27 years or, or so. Um, but she started as an instructor. She learned, got her commercial pilot's license and an instrument rating at Central Airways, and then, you know, had Airbc, where she met her husband, who's there, also an airline captain pilot. <laughs> um, so there's, these are so many wonderful stories. So many of these pilots will be coming on the ninth. Uh, here's my dad, there, and this is my aunt Jean, and these are large uh, exhibitions that are at the Chinese Canadian Archives at the Toronto Public Library. Uh, that opened in 2016, and we donated our dad's files and photographs, which we're thankful that he kept. It's why we could piece together his story and create the video with his photos. Um, but they put up this exhibition, and we visited, my sister and I, in uh, 2019. Uh, but this one, the staff at the center the archives did not know that my dad and, and the woman there with John Diefenbaker were related. <laughs> so Jean Lum is my, you know, two years younger than my dad. Uh, and so that's a 1957 photo when you know the story of, of Jean Lum, yeah. So there you are, and there we are. <laughs> and I'll just say that uh, it all started in Vancouver, Chinatown, um, and in Vancouver. So thank you so much. <laughs> What an evening to realize the contribution women have made. Like, here we are, three women, and we're talking about a very male-dominated industry. Well, the Wong brothers were not the only Chinese-Canadians passionate about flying. Um, I'm going to fill you in on just a few who took to the skies. Please understand, I am not going to cover everybody who ever flew before. Um, and I, uh, going down this rabbit hole in research, I really am indebted to researchers Matthias Eust and Patty Gully. Um, they've uh, explored some of this history before. And Patty is here tonight. I just want to introduce you to her. Patty, where are you? There you are. Thank you. Patty is the author of this book, Sisters of Heaven. And she wrote it about three Chinese aviators in China, female aviators, and one whom was buried in Vancouver and has a history here. We're not going to talk about them right now, but you can read about them in her book. So uh, obviously, pilots have to be trained and licensed, and it's at great expense. It turns out that all across Canada, there were small flight schools, one of them specifically established to train Chinese Canadians. Here we are, it's the summer of 1919, and we're outside of Saskatoon at the Kangwa Aviation School. With nickels and dimes raised by Chinese Canadian restaurateurs and farmers and merchants and laundrymen, the Chinese Nationalist League establishes this school in hopes of training pilots for their cause in China. Led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the Nationalists believed that modern air flight could help them defeat the squabbling warlords in China, and later, of course, the invading Japanese army. Chinese Canadians became a sort of farm team. The League raised enough money to hire instructors and buy a Curtis JN4 Jenny for the students to train on. Keng Wah operated until 1922 and trained about 17 pilots in its short three-year history. Naturally, it did raise the suspicion of the RCMP. The school's cook, for example, was ordered to spy on the students. CSIS would be proud. The first pilot to qualify at Kengwa was a man named Lim On. Lim and four other graduates went on to fly with, the Canton, with Canton Air Force in 1921, not to be confused with BC pilot On Lim, whom some of you may know. Lim On is also credited with inspiring and training by all counts that we can count, Canada's first female pilot, and most certainly our first 
Chinese Canadian female pilot. Here she is. Her name is Annie Lee. That's her husband, John Chong. They operated a, a restaurant in Edmonton. We are still piecing together Annie's life, but she was apparently born in BC, possibly in Lillooet. As well as being a mother and a businesswoman, she was most remarkably adventurous, daring, and free-spirited. In 1920, Lim On took her for a ride in the Kingwa plane, and she was smitten. So she signed up for lessons, and eventually, she bought her own plane. And she took lessons in 1923 with the famous World War I pilot, Wap May, where she learned to do simple aerobatics, or loop loops, as this article described them. And just for your reference, Amelia Earhart in the States makes her solo flight across the Atlantic in 1932. That's 10 years after Annie learned to fly. Unfortunately, Annie dies of an illness four years later, and she's only in her early 40s. Her obituary tells us she was also an amateur actor. She performed in local plays put on by the Nationalist League. And here's what we believe is a Chinatown Storytelling Center exclusive, if not an interesting aside. So, Annie Lee and John Chong had three children. Nellie, Thomas, and Stanley Chong. The youngest, Stanley, also had three children. They were born in Edmonton. He named them, he wasn't very creative, I guess, after himself and his siblings, that is Nellie, Thomas, and Stanley. <laughs> Following me? <laughs> Stanley's middle son is Thomas Chong, or this man. Oh. <laughs> Do you recognize him? Those of you old enough to know, that is the famed stoner, Tommy Chong of the 70s and 80s comedy duo, Cheech and Chong, and we believe Annie Lee's grandson. I don't even think Tommy knows this himself. One wonders who flew higher, Tommy <laughs> or Annie? Moving on. After the Kenghua School closes in 1922, the Chinese Nationalist League goes west to Vancouver Island, or Esquimalt specifically. Here is where Victoria's Chan Dun, who operated the Panama Cafe, Li Kuang Yi, and Ko Bong. Ko Bong is right there on the left. He, his four children all served in World War II. They opened the Chinese Aviation School in Victoria with the same intention of training Chinese Canadians to help the nationalists. They trained 10 students, half of whom go on to get their credentials. In this photo of their training plane, you can see vaguely five of Chan Dun's children scrambling over it. There's Maurice, Roy, Ira, Esther, and Alan. Little Ira and Roy and two other brothers, Paul and Herb, grow up to volunteer for service in World War II, although not as pilots. After 750 flights, the school had to close in 1923 when student Hip Kwong crashed their Jenny Canuck in Victoria Harbor, destroying the plane, but fortunately not Mr. Kwong. It's estimated that prior to World War II, almost 70 Chinese Canadians were trained at small flight schools across Canada, some wanting to fly for pure pleasure like Annie and others with the intent to be of service in China. Here in Vancouver, the interest in aviation is boosted by clubs like the Chinese Aero Club that was based on Pender Street in 1932, and then later its successor in 1945. Dan Liu, who's a CP Air mechanic, is the organizer of this Chinese Aero Club in the mid-40s. They are unofficially called the Flying Dragons. And there's also seven women members, which the Vancouver Sun dubbed the Flying Dragonettes. Pictured are Anne Liu, and Edna May Wong. Edna May Wong becomes Edna May Ng, who went on to found Success Realty. Wow. Yes, Jordan and um, Andrea's mom. As I mentioned, I'm not going to cover all the contributions of World War II pilots like Quan Louie here, but wartime is a factor in these next few stories. Albert and Cedric Ma are Prince Rupert born brothers. Alan Sed's nieces, Christine Chung and Jeannie Young, are here with us tonight. And Christine's dad. Um, these guys would go on to be decorated very belatedly with the Distinguished Flying Cross for their service in wartime by the US government. The Ma brothers are famous for making a record-breaking 757 flights over the hump. 
That's the infamous route over the Himalayas taken by the nationalists and the Americans in order to fly supplies into China during its battle with the communists. You might recognize the face of the oldest brother, Albert Ma. He's gracing the front, our front door. Because he's Chinese, Albert was refused admission to the Royal Canadian Air Force. So instead, he was hired as a flight instructor for the British Commonwealth Air Plan, and he was sent to Quebec City. I want you to meet him. Here he is in this clip from the Chinese Canadian Military Museum's Heroes Remember Project. He was interviewed by our friend Larry Wong in 2006. Well, I flew a little bit when I was 16, with a few lessons, and then I continued when I was about 18. And then from there on, I was lucky because the war uh, came on, and uh, otherwise said I might not have gotten a job being Chinese and so on. Did you try to join the um, Royal Canadian Air Force at that time, Al? I came back in... Uh, to Vancouver at the, in about 1940. And the recruiting uh, sergeant there uh, looked at me, he says, uh, you know, we can't take you, you're Oriental. So that was sort of a slight, you know, and I walked up Dunsmuir Street and there was Canadian Airways went in and spoke to the manager, Walter Gilbert. He, he says, how's your father? I says, my father passed away. He says, yes, I, I know. He says, everybody knew your father because he, he did a lot of philanthropy in Prince Rupert. And Wap May, he says, was, was a friend of your father. Wap will hire you. Next thing I got a letter from Edmonton and I was hired, and Wap was like part of our family from there on. He came to see my mother when she came back, and he's a very close friend. Refused by the Royal Canadian Air Force because of his race, Al became an air instructor for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Wap sent me to the uh, to Quebec City, and. Uh, uh, from there on, uh, we used to have about, oh, 60 aircraft in the air at once, uh, three flights or four flights of 13 each, and uh, some on compass swings and so on. Then we had what we called duty pilots, which I was included. They're actually flight commanders. We've commanded the flights which I was part of until 1943 when Pan American Airways called me and wanted me to go to Calcutta. When his contract was over, Al joined the China National Aviation Corporation, which was jointly owned by Pan American Airways and the Chinese Nationalist Government. And what did you do with uh, Pan American? Well, I joined them and I flew in Homestead, Florida for a while with them. And then everybody wanted to go to Calcutta because of the high pay. And it was uh, getting a lot of attention because China had been cut off from the seacoast and inland. The only way China could be supplied was from India. And uh, the high pay, however, being Chinese, when I went over, they only gave me a third of the pay that a white person. Al flew from a base in India into China carrying cargo, fuel, and personnel. His air route was one of the most dangerous in the war. Not only did he have to fly over the Himalayas, also known as the Hump, he was hunted by Japanese warplanes. We'd ice up, you know, and that was just as treacherous as the, uh, the Japanese coming up from uh, Bamo and so on. But uh, I think... Uh, Drinking with the boys at night was more dangerous sometimes. Fall on our heads or something. <laughs> so in 
So it's about wings over Canada. So returning to Canada, Albert based himself in Montreal. He got a literature degree, and he flew for Hydro-Quebec. His younger brother, Cedric, fulfilled his dream to be a bush pilot and flew all over the Arctic and northern BC. A coastal mountain is actually named Mount Sedma. After returning, BC born, another returning BC-born pilot who flew Lancaster bombing missions for the RCAF during World War II was Arthur Jung. Art was the brother of Canada's first Chinese-Canadian member of parliament, Douglas Jung, also a veteran. When Art came back from the war, he continued to fly privately and commercially. You can see from his very carefully inscribed logbook that his brother Douglas and his wife Vivian, who was to become the first Chinese-Canadian teacher hired by the Vancouver School Board, were among his passengers in 1947. Sadly, Art was killed when his Pacific Western Airlines Boeing 707 crashed outside of Edmonton in 1973. There's a memorial there to the five crew members who died in Leduc. Captain Jung and his crew were en route from Toronto to Seoul, and they were transporting 86 cattle. There's one other Canadian-born brother duo that I want to mention, and this is where I get to be personal. My Alberta-born father, Hong, and his older brother, Lim. This is my uncle, Lim, who I never met. He was 17 years old when he started training at the Edmonton and Northern Alberta Aero Club, and he got his pilot's license in 1933. Lim ended up joining the Chinese Air Force and was heralded a war hero in China's fight against the Japanese Air Force. Here he is with nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek in 1941. Chiang Kai-shek on the very left there. A year after this photo, just like Said and El Ma, Lim joined the China National Aviation Corporation to fly supplies over the hump. Only this story ends in 1944 because Uncle Lim has a fatal crash on one of those missions, leaving his wife and two young daughters, my cousins. His family mourns. And what does Lim's brother do? My father breaks his mother's heart and he learns to be a pilot as well. That's my dad. By the time he graduates from high school in Kelowna, we are into the post-war boom. Like the Ma brothers, he gets his pilot's license in California, and he takes up bush flying in the 1950s. While flying the wilds of Ontario, he marries our mum, a bona fide Vancouver-born city slicker. He joins Pacific Western Airlines and is transferred to Fort Smith Northwest Territories, where my sisters and I are born. My sisters Diane and Carolyn are here tonight. And we agree we were much cuter back then. <laughs> you can guess which one is which. From our hometown, our father flies all over, the, all over the Arctic, transporting firefighters, geologists, government officials, the injured, medics, the mail, food, supplies, and even husky dogs. He gains a modest notoriety with his escapades with a spread in the National Weekend magazine. I've actually, my sister dug out the magazine, so I've got it if you want to see it. It's from, it's, it, in the old days, it was a national thing that came in the paper. Eventually, my memories are hazy, but I do recall how engaged and animated he was when he socialized with his fellow pilots and mechanics. Eventually, it, uh, our dad is transferred to Prince Rupert, and in 1967, his amphibious Cessna 185 crashes into a mountainside in bad weather, and he's killed. Such is the risky life of early aviators. People have asked if I'm afraid to fly. I am not. Whenever I get on board a plane as a passenger, there's part of me that thinks my uncle and my dad's spirits are in that cockpit, ensuring that I'll have a safe journey. Uh, but do I want to sit in the cockpit as Evelyn and Annika do? No way. <laughs> I'm happy to sit back, relax, and enjoy the movies. From the early days of flight, earning a pilot's license has always been formidable, as our next guest will attest. My dad had to borrow money from his sister to qualify in California back in the 50s. Fast forward to 2012, we were able to set up a scholarship in Hong Mar's name to support a BCIT aviation graduate. The winner of that scholarship in 2021 is our next speaker. Annika Sung is currently taking her instructor's training and she's got a big exam tomorrow, so we're really grateful that she's here with us today. She graduated as a fixed wing pilot last year. 
We've invited her tonight to tell her story of why she wanted to become a pilot. So it's such a privilege to be here tonight to learn about the history of our Chinese Canadian aviators. Prior to this, I actually never thought about it because I wasn't born into aviation and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let's start with childhood. I was born in China, in Shandong province, a small town called Hezhe. My parents loved to travel when I was a child. As you can see in those pictures, they go from Dalian to Shanghai to Hezhe, where I was born. So how did I get into aviation? I was an arts major. I did my bachelor's degree major in psychology and minoring in English literature. So when it was time to find a job, what can I do, right? I thought about all my past experiences and something came to mind. When I was 11 years old, it was my first ever flight. And that was from Beijing to Vancouver when we came over to Canada. My English was next to nothing. I knew how to say desk and pencil, and that's about it. And as a child, when you're on a large airplane, you know, flying that high in the sky, you're not very comfortable. I didn't eat anything on the way, and it's a 12-hour flight. After the second meal, a flight uh, attendant came over, this beautiful lady, and she brought over two fruit cups. And back then, my mom couldn't really speak English either. So they sort of communicated with each other, and we understood that what she meant was, you know, your daughter didn't eat. It's a long flight. We saw that she ate her fruit cup. She must like it, so here are two more. This tiny little gesture really warmed my heart. You know, being a child, coming over to a new country, speaking different language, leaving all of your friends and families behind, you feel apprehensive. Are they going to be nice to me? Will I make friends? But after that tiny, tiny little gesture, I felt the care that I was given. Maybe Canada is not so bad. Maybe everybody is nice like that, right? So when I was looking for a job, back to the job hunting, I was like, oh, I want to be a flight attendant. I want to offer the same type of service that I was given on my first trip from China to Canada. Because Air Canada was hiring flight attendants, and they required two languages, at least, English and the root language. I thought with my Mandarin, I would be able to communicate with those passengers and make them feel comforted. And that's exactly what I did. I joined as a flight attendant, and those red dots on the map are all the locations that I have gone to in my capacity as a flight attendant. Yes, very well traveled. <laughs> 30, 20, 10. It's actually not a simulator. It's an actual landing into YVR. That was my first ever flight as a flight attendant. The captain found out I was the baby of the company. <laughs> yeah, seniority list. I was the one that was not drawn out of the hat. I was the last one on the list. Across all the bases in Canada, 307 out of 307, the number of people that trained in that phase. So the baby of the company is on board. What can we do for her? <laughs> Show her a landing in the flight deck of a 777. I sat there, and I was ast astounded. It's so calm. It's almost eventless. There was a bit of talking to the tower and, you know, minor adjustments, but not much was going on. You know what I thought? I think I can do that, <laughs> right? Well, why not be a pilot? And that's where I moved, where my aspirations came from. As I said, I wasn't born into aviation. I, had, I never thought about flying a plane, but that event right there, aviation chose me. So then, fast forward to my training. I joined the BCIT program, the Airline and Flight Operations Commercial Pilot Program in 2020, and I have just graduated. My graduation, my convocation was actually um, a week ago, on the 22nd. And uh, here are some pictures of uh, the sky that I've taken. It's so beautiful. 
What's it like to be a pilot? Of course, everyone thinks about the glamour, a captain traveling to all corners of the world. There's a saying in Chinese, 台上一分钟,台下十年功. This means for one minute of spotlight on the stage, it takes 10 years of hard work and practice to get there. So being a pilot means never-ending learning, exams, like the one I have tomorrow, <laughs> making sure your skills are in tip-top shape and to keep everyone safe. And this is also keeping tip-top shape. You can barely see anything, but I was flying at night. I overflew the Vancouver airport and felt very privileged. So for me, being a pilot is not the end goal. It's only the beginning. It's what you do with your pilot license that really matters. Aviation is woven into our social fabric. And you know, the things that we do. We reunite friends and loved ones, provide disaster relief, search and rescue operations, facilitating medical care, bringing necessities of life to those communities that are not reachable on ground. I'm proud that I will be able to bring smiles to people in our community. A few months ago, I saw this article in the New York Times. You know what? We need more faces like me and like you and your children. <laughs> we need to see that aviation is possible, it's available, and it's attainable. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Similarly, it takes a whole community to make a great pilot. So what's next? What's in store for the future? We need to show the next generation support and guidance. So we need to give out, you know, scholarships, <laughs> job opportunities, or even just a pat on the back to say you can do it, the encouragement. I am here tonight because <laughs> Ramona spotted me as a recipient of the Hamar Memorial Award a graduating award from BCIT. I'm very thankful for your friends and family and their generosity. Economically, it helped me with my education. But more importantly, it was a recognition of all the hard work that I have put in to be where I am today, to become a pilot. And it reminded me that I'm not alone. I have a whole community out here to cheer me on, to say, we see you and we're proud of you. And we need more of that. So this gives me the motivation to overcome all the challenges and hardships, and I thank you so much. And uh, giving back to the community is an integral part of my life as well. I volunteer quite a bit. Even though school is busy, I like to spend my time with those around me, you know, showing other people that they can do it too. This is a picture from the Fly It Forward event at Glacier Air earlier this year, where they fly um, women and girls, they take them on an introductory flight, seeing the beautiful Squamish. And you, when you see the sparkle in the kids' eyes, it's all worth it. Captain Glenn Ortson <laughs> invited me to a talk, and, uh, and we introduced to them the jobs of, of being a flight attendant, my uh, path to become a pilot, and you know how to become a captain. Once you speak to these kids, you know, you really open up the future for them. They start thinking about it. Thinking about it is the first step. I co-founded Approaching Finals. This is a program where it was started by pilot in training for other girls like me, for other pilots in training. We invite amazing speakers to talk, come talk to us about their um, experience. And we also have flight training refreshers. If there are any aspiring pilots out there, they're welcome to join. This is for girls only, but <laughs> there are other programs out there too. And the last one I want to talk about is Dreams Take Flight. I first learned about this program when I first came to Canada. My dad was working in the hospital, and he came to me one day. He said, Annika, did you know Canada is a great country? I said, huh? He said, there's a program where they take children with sickness or in positions of need, and they take them down for a day in Disneyland. And I said, oh, that's amazing. I've never been to Disneyland. And fast forward almost uh, 15 years, 
When I came to Vancouver, I had the privilege of being introduced to this program, Dream Stake Flight, and exactly the one that my dad was talking about. So instead of being the kid being flown down to Disneyland for a day of fun, I am the one contributing and helping. It's a very meaningful, meaningful event. I can't be here today without the love of my family and my friends. After I got my commercial pilot license, one of the first things I did was to take my grandparents up on a ride to see the beautiful Vancouver. They were very chill back there. They weren't scared at all. It was just a normal car ride for them. <laughs> they looked outside the windows like, yeah, all right, okay. We're flying this guy. They didn't think that it was impossible for their granddaughter to fly the plane. And you know what? This is one of the most beautiful, or two of the most beautiful gifts that my family has given me. Self-reliance and confidence. They have always told me, you can do anything you want. You can achieve any heights. Just work hard and go for it. Just like Evelyn said. So yes, exactly, just go for it. And they have given me so much support, both economically and emotionally. My mom actually calls me every single day on her drive home from work. I'm not too sure if it's because she misses me or because I'm just a time filler instead of listening to the radio. This was the last time when I came over to uh, the Storytelling Center with Ramona and Susanna. Thank you for this beautiful place. And I have learned so much about our heritage and our culture. And uh, I invite everybody to take a look. It's amazing what they're doing here. And I would love for my friends to come and visit this as well. Thank you. You know how I said I didn't want to be a pilot at all? And after listening to you two, I still don't. <laughs> Hats off to you. I mean, really, I don't have it. Until next time, safe journey home. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>